if you're listening to this and you're in the industry and you want to be a marketer or you're an artist marketing yourself and you want to know how you can derive truth from a test, it's important for you to know that like your main problem is going to be isolating variables. You are now listening to the Creative Juice podcast brought to you by Indopreneur.io. What's up, Indies? Welcome back to Creative Juice. I'm your host, Jack McCarthy, and this is episode 277. With me today is your co-host, Circa. Cirque, what's up, dude? Not a whole lot, friend. You know, just working hard. Excited to be here. I think you guys are going to dig this episode today because we're going to be bringing some intel, some insight, some alpha, whatever cool phrase you want to use to describe the split test that we were running and the results that we found from it at our music marketing agency, IndieX. I think this is going to be particularly interesting to anyone who has an online store or who's running ads for growing their following or for growing their sales. This is going to be pretty cool. Yeah. And for those of you out there who don't know what that is, because we always like to sort of break it down for all levels in marketing, when we want to know if a given strategy or tactic, if it outperforms what we were doing before, we'll run a split test where we'll kind of set all the parameters to be the same except for that one idea. And so we have our control group, which is like what we've always done. And then we change that one parameter and run it again. And we see if one performed better than the other. And that's how we validate ideas in marketing. Marketing can be very scientific with split tests. And really, you know, the strength of a marketer or a marketing team is the accumulation of the split tests that they've run in the past or that, you know, what they've learned from other people's split tests. So that's how we get knowledge in marketing. Yeah. And this is particularly fun. We did an episode a few months back on how we run split test at IndieX and how we work together as a team to come up with ideas and strategies that we might want to prove or disprove and hypotheses that we think are cool that kind of allow us to test the norms and the knowns and see what's changing. And it's a really fun process that we do each and every month as a team. It's kind of like a little challenge that we have across the whole IndieX agency team. And we thought it would be fun for this episode to bring some of the results from a few split tests to you guys so that you can think about them. Maybe undergo these split tests yourself to see how they work out for you. But I think that these are going to be pretty cool. I'll make sure that we link to the split test, how we split test episode that we did a few months back in the show notes here so that you guys can listen back to that and kind of understand the high level process so that we can get a little bit more into the nitty gritty here today. So what do you think, Cirque? Where should we kick off? I'm very excited. I would love to, because I'm not as privy to this as Jack. I wasn't part of the group running these, so I'm excited to hear about them. But kind of what's the summary here? Like if you were to give a title to the three split tests that we're talking about today. For sure. Yeah. These are primarily traffic related split tests. So advertising. Yeah. Advertising related split tests and how they relate to different types of conversion, which is pretty cool. So it's a traffic and conversion split test, which fits in nicely with a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about on the show recently. I think that this will be particularly interesting because these span across, I would say, different career growth objectives. One is all about audience growth, specifically on streaming platforms. Spotify, we did a split test related to different campaign objectives, advertising campaign objectives when it comes to driving traffic over to Spotify. We also did a conversion related test when it comes to e-commerce store opt-in pop-ups, which was an interesting one for me to undergo. And we have another split test about the number of ads that go into an ad set in your ad campaign. And we can get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of what all that means. If you've never run an ad campaign before, that might have sounded like Chinese to you, but we can dive into the depths of that a little bit further. But of those three, what would you like to hear about first? I would love to start off with the traffic versus conversion split tests. This is a hotly debated one, I think. I think there's a lot of information going around on the internet about how to structure campaigns where you're driving traffic to DSPs, to Spotify, to Apple Music, whatever it might be, and whether running a conversion campaign where you're optimizing for an event on a landing page, like a Tone Den landing page or a Linktree page, or 
sending traffic and optimizing for link clicks and which of those is the most effective at driving streaming growth. And that was kind of what we wanted to test in this split test that we ran. Yeah, this one's near and dear to my heart because, you know, I'm an old dog marketer. Like I'm only 33, but, you know, it's a fast paced world. Things change a lot. And just going off of my gut and what I know about advertising, we ended up at a place where to all of our indies, Basically, our indies want to grow their Spotify, and they want to pump traffic from a social media platform to their Spotify. And so when this was very new, the strategy was, okay, let's use a bridge page. A bridge page being, instead of sending them from the platform to Spotify where you can't track anything, let's send them to an interstitial page where they have to click to then go to Spotify or whatever their streaming platform is. And then with Facebook ads with a lot of different ad platforms, you can put some code on a, on any web page and that code will run when someone visits that web page and it'll send their IP address or whatever data they have back to the the ad platform to say hey this person made it here that's called a conversion and you can put them on the you know the thank you page of a purchase and that tells you someone bought this thing you put them on the thank you page of a s- email sign up it tells them someone signed up for this email list in this case we're putting it on that bridge page and saying, okay, let's optimize the ad campaign. Let's make it run better over time with the objective of conversions. You know, we want Facebook ads or whatever to pay special attention when someone lands on that bridge page because it means that they were the right person and they made it to the destination. Problem with that is it's not the destination. And there's a high degree of fall off from that bridge page to Spotify. So at a certain point, we were just like, it's no longer makes sense. Let's just try traffic because we're going to get cheaper clicks. You pay more for a thousand impressions uh, on an ad platform when you're having the ad platform do that heavy lifting of optimizing for the conversion. But if you're just telling it, I just want clicks and I'll deal with it, then you get a cheaper ad cost. And so we're just like, let's just do traffic. But the rest of the world kept on marching with this, you know, bridge page, run conversions. And a lot of people are even saying, run conversions without the bridge page. And the problem with that is that there's no conversion. There's ne- You're not going to put a pixel code on Spotify and, and get it to tell your ad platform when someone streams your track. So there's a lot of misguided new advertisery kind of advice. It's like, no, that's not going to work. And here's why traffic is probably better. And it's something we've said and we've fought this dogma kind of tooth and nail, but we we never had any real data to back it up except that whenever I ran it, it always worked better with traffic. So, well, I think you guys will like the data that we have on this particular split test then, which affirmed a lot of the hypotheses that we had about traffic versus conversions. To give kind of the full picture, we spent $200 on a conversions campaign, driving traffic to a bridge page. Like Cirque was saying, we were actually optimizing for a standard event on button click over to a streaming platform. That would fire the Facebook pixel with the event, the view content pixel event. And just to clarify what Jack's saying there is that not when they make it to this page, do we tell Facebook that this was successful when they actually click the button to go over to the streaming platform, which is a little bit better because some of the people who make it to the page won't actually click that button. Right, right, exactly. So we really wanted to get as close to the streaming destination and not only the streaming destination, but the actual process of landing into Spotify or Apple Music or whatever it might be and clicking the play button and playing through. We wanted to get as close as possible to that. So that was how that campaign was set up. We spent $200 on it and then we spent $200 on a traffic campaign optimizing for just link clicks directly to the streaming platform. And the results were interesting to say the least. We saw double the amount of clicks from the traffic campaign at 30 cents a click versus half the amount of clicks at 61 cents a click and 78 cents per conversion. And that was people who were clicking on the button on the bridge page, right? So you can see where there was some drop off going on there. But here was what was most interesting during that split test was we actually saw double the amount of followers created from the traffic campaign There were 69 new followers versus 27 new followers on the conversion campaign. And the listeners 
during the traffic campaign period of the split test were 15,000 versus 14,100 of the conversions campaign. So what we were seeing was an increase in listenership and a, an increase in followership during the traffic campaign that was at a lesser level, a lesser degree during the conversion campaign. So you can kind of see what the split test was telling us here was that the traffic campaign was, generally speaking, getting us a greater result than what we were getting from the conversions campaign. And we attributed that to, in some part, the increased reach and the cheaper increased reach that we were seeing during that traffic campaign campaign that was creating what we would call somewhat of a fan finder type halo effect where there was organic traffic that wasn't necessarily tied to a button click heading over to Spotify, heading over to Apple Music. In this case, it was Spotify heading over to streaming and going and, you know, becoming a listener. So it was really an interesting test. Yeah, it seems interesting. It's also important we point out the difficulty of actually getting like a scientific result. In marketing, especially, it can be very difficult. This is about as scientific as we can get it. But it's important that we like, we don't like to sort of sweep the mess under the rug. We like to kind of, you know, make it very transparent. That's kind of our style. And when it comes to marketing tests, the problem is that you can't dip your toe in the same stream twice because the stream has changed. Your toe hasn't changed, but the stream has changed. So you can't actually get exactly similar conditions. One way to do that might be to start two identical fake artist profiles on Spotify and two identical fake artist profiles on the social media platform you're advertising on and then do it that way. They have to be entirely identical and you want to run them on the same day. The problem with that is that you might expose an audience to the same artist twice with from different sources. Right. So you even then you can't dip your toe in the same stream twice. There's always the chance that one of each ad is going to reach the same person and then you can't really attribute it. And that's the problem with attribution in marketing. It's like, it's this exact problem. So we don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt. We don't know scientifically, you know, mathematically that this is the case, but generally these types of split tests can yield some pretty good presumptions to go off of. Yeah, I'm glad that you preface with that, Cirque, because not only is it really challenging and kind of a, what I would say, like you could, you could keep going and regressing into like, well, we need to isolate it more. Oh, we need to isolate it more than that. You can really go down a rabbit hole trying to make a perfect scientific test, which is really, really challenging. And it's particularly challenging when we're doing this with clients in a lot of cases where they don't want to be building secondary Spotify profiles or multiple social media yeah. profiles or lots yeah. of ad accounts. Generally speaking, it's not advantageous for them to be doing that, especially just in the name of science for us at the agency. You know, yeah. we're trying to drive a result for them. And in a lot of cases, we're working with what we've got in front of us and what we can do, not necessarily what we, you know, could do at an infinite possibility level. Yeah, yeah. In marketing, it's very difficult to isolate variables, isolate parameters in order to get these sort of highly valid or like scientifically rigorous tests done. But I would say the margin of error here isn't 50%, it's like 10%, right? So you don't have to worry too much about it, but it is important to point out because if you're listening to this and you're in the industry and you want to be a marketer or you're an artist marketing yourself and you want to know how you can derive truth from a test, it's important for you to know that like your main problem is going to be isolating variables. Yeah, that's definitely the truth of any any kind of marketing test. At the end of the day, I think as an intelligent marketer, you have to know when to say die a little bit. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, that's very cool. I'm glad that I can now give a data backed, you know, version of this and say, like, well, we tested it. For sure. Yeah. And I think if you're someone that's running conversion campaigns for streaming growth and you're struggling with it and feeling like it's too expensive, feeling like, you know, the results just aren't consistent that you should consider trying a traffic split test and seeing what it does for you. It might yield a better result. We've seen it yield better results time and time again, but this data really showed why, which was pretty exciting. The next split test that I'd like to kind of dive into here was another advertising related split test. And this was related to the number of ads inside of an ad set in an ad campaign. 
And to preface with a little bit of information on what I mean by that to anyone who might be new to advertising online on social media, typically in a lot of advertising platforms online, we're going to be specifically talking about Meta, Facebook, and Instagram ads. You have umbrellas inside of your ad account. You can think about them as levels to your campaign. You have the campaign level, which is where you set up objectives, what the goal of your campaign is. Oftentimes you'll set a budget there too. And then you have ad sets, which is typically where your targeting lives, where your budget lives from time to time. And you also set up the parameters of where you want your ads to be placed. So whether you might see your ads on news feeds on Facebook and Instagram, whether they might live primarily in reels or in stories. And then you have your ads level, where is actually where the copy, the creative, where you select the page or the profile that you're advertising with exists. And the hypothesis in question here was whether older advice about the number of ads to include in an ad set was changing. And a few years ago, especially as we started to get into what was called campaign budget optimization, where you set budget at the campaign level, it was often talked about to say a best practice was to have as many ads as you could spin out to live under an ad set so that the campaign could shift budget around as it needed to and allow that budget to spread out to get you an optimal result. But over the years, that best practice has kind of eroded away. And so what we wanted to test was what would perform better, an ad set with 10 to 15 ads in it or an ad set with four to five. And so what what we did was we created ad sets with a winning offer for one of our clients, an offer that they had been running for quite some time that had been performing well with a winning audience, something, an interest-based audience that had performed well for them in the past and actually was performing well for them at the time and winning creatives. So we went with winning copy, we went with winning video and image creatives, and we wanted to test those against each other. So we had an ad set with 16 ads in it and an ad set with five ads in it. And this was what we ran tests on for a number of weeks to see which would perform best. Cirque, do you have any guesses as to what we saw? Yeah. So you got to think of an ad like a machine learning model, a lot like ChatGPT in that it's going to randomly adjust parameters or learn about which parameters to adjust based on an input or an error mechanism. And the error mechanism is, did they do the thing you wanted them to do or did they not do the thing you wanted them to do? There's a couple of sub mechanisms like, um, you know, did they stop when, when they scrolled by the ad, did they stop on it? How long did they spend on it? If they didn't do the conversion you wanted, did they at least click it? This can give it some clues as to how to adjust parameters in the ad. What parameters? That's all about the campaign shell that Jack talked about. You know, you have ad campaigns. Within that, there's one or more ad sets. And within each ad set, there's one or more ads. And the parameters that can be adjusted are exactly what you set at those different levels. So at the campaign level, you might have an objective, what you want the ad to be doing. And very, you know, within the last five years, we now have the ability to set the budget at the campaign level. And then you have ad sets within that campaign, ad sets where you can set audience, like Jack said, placement where the ad actually runs. And beforehand, you know, Before five years ago, we could only set budget at the ad set level. And then within each ad set, you have one or more ads. And ads are where you set the actual ad, the creative, like video or image, the copy. And so the ad campaign can't actually, well, actually now it can adjust your copy and creative because you can put multiples in there and it'll jumble them all up. But beforehand, you just had an ad. So all it could do at that level was decide which ad to show. And so if an ad did particularly well, it would say, let's show this ad more. And then with campaign budget optimization, where you set the budget at the campaign level, now it can do that with ad sets. It can say, well, this ad set is doing better. So this combination of ads plus location targeting, interest targeting, and placement, that's working best. We're going to give more budget to this one. And so the reason that I was interested in this and the reason that I presume it doesn't really matter is because when you run an ad set with 15 different ads in it, you're not running 15 ads. You're running whichever ones the ad set decides are best. 
Okay, so very quickly, it's going to throw out a majority of your ads and find some winners and give most of the budget over to those winners. So when you run 15 ads and then you run only five of those in a different ad set, after you know a few days of actually spending budget, chances are you're gonna be running virtually the same ad sets. And that goes back to this thing of like, it's very difficult to control parameters. And if you get a no result in a test or a split test, you have to examine, did I actually test something or do I have virtually the same parameters? And that's why it, it, you know, it did what it did. Yeah, for sure. And I think that was a good explanation, Sirk. And to give a little bit more context on, on one of the reasons beyond uh, hearing about and learning about evolving best practices from other agencies and other marketers talking about this, I actually had started to dig into this after talking to one of our reps at Facebook and going through ad accounts with him. And he was saying like, you know, kill, basically kill off these additional ads that are running in this campaign. And I was like, well, what about spreading the budget and, al and allowing for the campaign to optimize around these ads? And we started to talk about attribution visibility post iOS 14. And he was saying, you know, in a lot of cases, what we're seeing on, on Meta's side was these lesser performing ads getting budget skewed to them inappropriately during this time. So it's you know, becoming more of a best practice to have fewer in there as you scale so that the platform can optimize appropriately instead of, you know, kind of just misspending where it shouldn't be, which, you know, prior to iOS 14 may have not been as much of an issue. With the actual ad platforms, machine learning, we got very comfortable as advertisers because it was such perfect data. Easy mode. Yeah, that you could just throw whatever at the wall and then, you know, you don't even have to see what sticks because the, the campaign itself is going to optimize all these parameters and only actually spend budget on what sticks. So you don't have to delete all the other stuff. You can just let it not get any budget. And the benefit is, let's say you have an audience of a million people you're running like an ad set to. And then after a while of running, it decides 900,000 of them are irrelevant. We're going to show it to just these 100,000 because they're, they're the best performing. They have the best performing type. And then quickly, it's going to burn through that 100,000, show them all the ad many, many times. And it doesn't have anything to pivot to unless you left that in there. So it was actually a benefit to be like, well, we'll leave these in here so that the ad platform doesn't fatigue out our audience. But now we don't have perfect data because of iOS 14. And the data tracking for these ad platforms is piss poor compared to what it was in like 2018. So you have to, you have to massage your, your ad campaigns a lot more. You have to make some hard decisions, cut things. And just put a lot more manual control over the ad platform. You can't be lazy as, a, as an advertiser anymore with these social media platforms. So Yeah, for sure. So I thought that was really interesting. Definitely a best practice, I would say, to, to be kind of on the lookout for and see how this changes over time, especially as like privacy related changes continue because we're not done, you know, like this is going to be an ongoing sort of evolving change that happens on all sorts of advertising platforms. So I think this is one to kind of be on the lookout for. I'm certainly going to be like keeping my ear to the wall about testing different configurations and, and different setups. Um, it's kind of changed the way I look at media buying a little bit. It's definitely not as static in terms of recommendations as maybe it used to be. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, let's hear about this final test. This final test was uh, not advertising related necessarily, more conversion related. And I think if if any of you have an online store, and I hope most of you do, uh, this will be an interesting one to learn about. This was a split test regarding getting opt-ins on your online store. If you're familiar with e-commerce, you've probably been to an online store where you're offered some sort of discount upon arriving at the store. Sometimes it's a, you know, a first-time customer discount. Usually see a 10% or more type of, uh, type of freebie offer that's out there. You see it in all types of stores. We wanted to test on some information that I was kind of gathering amongst e-commerce marketers was the idea of a two-step opt-in versus a one-step opt-in and what would yield a better result in terms of conversion rate 
and conversion to sales upon opt-in. And what I mean by two-step versus one-step is we tested on one of our client stores who was getting a lot of traffic. We tested an opt-in, a pop-up upon landing on his store. Users would see a pop-up that either said, you want 10% off your first order? Name and email. Enter your name and email. There would be fields right there. Or that's the one step. The two step was, hey, do you want 10% off your first order on me? Yes or no. And then if they clicked yes, they would go to a second step that would then ask them for their name and email. That's the two step. And the test that we were doing here was, would a two step yield a higher conversion rate of viewer to opt-in subscriber, and then also a higher opt-in to customer to purchase. And the results are curious uh, because it differed from what I was kind of hearing about and discussing amongst some peers in the e-commerce space. Yeah. So it's important to know, because you might be asking yourself, like, why, why does it matter? What's, you know, what's this two-step concept? And why does it apply, like having them click a button? It's important you know where one step versus two step originated. It originated with order forms on a checkout page. So you would typically have on, you know, you're going to check out for an item online and you're instantly met with a wall of fields. The more fields there are, the less likely you are to actually purchase. And this is what we call friction. Every additional field is more friction. It's just harder to check out and you might get distracted. Something might happen. Like the more time you have to spend, the more effort you have to put in, the harder it's going to be to get high conversions. And so the two-step process is instead of getting them to fill out name, email, address, phone number, address, credit card, all that stuff, instead split it up. So when they get to the page, they only see name and email. That's easy. Easy. It's not too difficult. Yep. And then they type it in and they click continue. And a couple of things happen here. Number one, they've already completed part of the process, which gives that sort of pot committed cognitive bias. We're like, well, I'm already, you know, I already did some of this. It's also what's known as a micro commitment. Micro commitment. Yep. Yeah. And this is a concept from the six principles of influence, commitment and consistency. If people commit to something in some way publicly, they're much more likely to remain consistent with that action. So you know, if you can bake in micro commitments, it's why salespeople ask a lot of obvious yes questions, because getting you to say yes repeatedly is a form of micro commitment and it makes it harder to say no to the final sale. And so these micro commitments are great. But another reason that two step order forms are great is because typically on the first step, you're getting email address. And that email, when they click continue, it's technically an opt-in and you can send them card abandonment emails if they don't check out. So you can rescue some of those lost checkouts. And so it was always a debate as to whether like, okay, two-step order forms are more friction technically because they have to enter it, click a button, wait for load, enter more stuff. Is that outweighed by the fact that you're getting the micro commitment and you're getting the email address and you can rescue some with card abandonment emails or you can retarget with an ad because you can upload the email address to a, to an ad platform and run ads. And I, you know, never really any definitive or conclusive answers, but this whole two step opt in is a very new thing. If you said to me two step opt in, I would think, okay, it's asking for my name and then my email address, or it's asking for my email address and then my name on the second step. But no, in this case, they were saying a yes or no button as the form of micro commitment. Yeah. And what was interesting about this test and kind of the psychology behind it was to see by getting this micro commitment of yes, would you get a and a subscriber that would become more likely to be a purchaser, AKA, are we getting people that are coming to our site and just becoming coupon collectors and not <laughs> using the coupon versus are we getting people who are high intent sort of buyers? And to be honest, when running this test, I was really hoping that the two-step opt-in process would create that sort of buyer's mentality and that that subscriber cohort that would be most likely to buy, but it didn't pan out that way. Here's what happened. It was really interesting. We actually saw the same opt-in rate using the one-step form versus the two-step form. Uh, we saw a 6.3% conversion rate from uh, viewer to lead, which was interesting for one. But then what we saw with the two-step versus one-step subscriber cohorts, the leads from 
lead to customer, actually we saw a higher rate of one-step opt-in form leads turning into customers. There were 44% conversion to purchase with that group of people versus 26.7% with the two-step. So the one-step had 44% conversion to purchase and the two-step had 26.7% conversion to purchase. So actually, in this case, in this split test, the one-step opt-in form outperformed. Now, I will say that during the testing period, we saw a higher sales volume overall in the store when testing the two-step, but that was more attributed to just an increase in overall traffic during that time period, as opposed to any sort of incidental related to the the pop-up testing. Yeah. If I were behind this test and I'm interpreting results, I would say it's very difficult because the assumption being that okay, which one here? What was the thesis? We had less friction versus micro commitments. So clearly here, less friction better, right? But I would have a hard time actually like going forward and saying minimize friction across all potential like experiences and we're going to get higher conversions. I would much more presume that a a portion of the difference, we saw like what, 100% increase in conversions with less friction, nearly. And I don't think you get a hundred percent increase in conversions from removing one button click friction. I would agree. Yeah. In fact, I would say if it were the friction that was the problem, we would see less opt-ins. For sure. And we didn't. Because it would stop them from ever actually signing up. Right. Exactly. So I, d- I would have a hard time attributing less friction to more purchases. And I would say like, it's just same stream twice kind of stuff. People just were more in the buying mood and this didn't greatly impact their willingness to buy. It was just like a luck of the draw. And if we run it again a hundred times, we probably see that Delta even out a little bit. For sure. Yeah. And so that's why I wanted to close with this split test, because I think it's a useful one to perform if you have a store, whether or not you're using an opt-in pop-up of some kind on it with a with a discount type bribe that leads people to a sale. I think this can be a worthy one to test, especially if you're seeing a lot of opt-ins and not a lot of conversion to customers. This could be a lever to potentially test out and try. It's relatively easy to set up with most autoresponders and e-commerce platforms. It's really, really easy to do. It doesn't take a lot of extra effort. The lift of it is relatively easy. It's easy to swap them out. If you've got traffic to your store, you're not really having to worry too much about spending a ton of money to uh, to perform this test. So definitely worthwhile in that way, I think, to see if there's you know a lever to pull there as far as converting leads into uh, customers. But yeah, I would agree with you, Cirque. I think this one was a bit inconclusive for me and a, probably a worthwhile thing just to keep in the back of your head and in your in your toolkit as something you can try. Yeah, and I would say the value you can extract from this episode is not only all the concepts we've gone over make you you know more proficient at online marketing, but also you can take away from this that like we often have to tell our community if someone asks us for a definitive answer on something and we don't have data or the data we have is not necessarily true for every artist, every genre, every time period, all of these other parameters, then we'll just say test it. And what we mean when we say test it is this, because we're not just like hand wavy, like go away, test it. We're saying like literally test it because that's the only way you're gonna know for your brand and your audience and the era in which you live. Knowing how to split test in marketing definitely jumps you up a level in terms of marketing proficiency. And hopefully this episode has given you an insight into that process, controlling parameters, trying to get, you know, only one variable change between the different groups, and then how to interpret results and how to like meaningfully decide on these things. Because you don't always walk away with a meaningful sort of hard and fast rule that you can use forever and just eke out better performance. But sometimes you do. Yeah, dude, well said. I think something I've increasingly gotten more comfortable with over the years has been the phrase, test it and it depends. I think early on as a marketer, like those those phrases make you uncomfortable because it's like no one really wants to hear like it depends. They want an answer. But the truth is, you're right. Like there are so many variables. There is a lot of blindness or unscientific bumps in the road when doing these types of 
tests for marketing campaigns that have all those variables, you can see where I'm going with this, yeah. that there's a lot of stuff that depends. And so this is why we run tests at the agency in the way that we do, because we're trying to learn, we're trying to gather as much data as we can, and then, you know, take that data and make recommendations to our clients, apply them to the strategies that we run at the company. And it really just helps us learn, you know, evolve our recommendation stack, uh, evolve the way that we run campaigns and get the best possible result that we can. So this is something that we do on a regular basis. Like I said, we kind of make it fun and we make it a challenge amongst the team to bring new ideas and, and fresh things that we can test sort of in the in the sandboxes that we have at the agency. And I hope that this first sort of highlight session is the first of many that we can do on the show as we do more and more of this uh, over time. Yeah, every time we get a split test result, we should bring it to the to the pod just because, like, it's community knowledge, you know? For sure, yeah. I, I think when initially coming up with this idea, it came also with the spirit of, like, if we come up with something and it totally dive bombs, I would love to talk about that too. You know, I'd love to talk about like when we were right. And I would love to talk about when we were wrong because no matter what you kind of win in that scenario. Yeah. And this is like a lifelong, this is a life lesson. Okay. It's something I've had to learn time and time again and am learning it in business like every year. It's not what you don't know. It's what you think you know that just ain't so. Yeah. Yeah. That'll kill you. It's not in business, in trying to build a career, in trying to do anything. It's not, you know, what you don't know that's the problem. It's when you make big, expensive bets on things that you could have for cheaper, for less time, or for less effort figured out wasn't going to be the best strategy. Wasting a lot of time doing something that's like suboptimal. And carrying around dogma, just because you heard someone who you kind of respect say it should be this way, like that's what's really going to be the silent killer and, and what's going to sap your motivation and your energy and your output. So, yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. So I hope you guys dug this. Take these split tests. Try them out for yourself. See what you might learn. Maybe it'll differ from what we gathered in our testing. But I hope you guys dug this. We'll definitely be bringing more of these to Creative Juice. But until then... See you guys next time. And stop running conversions campaigns to Spotify. He said it, not me. <laughs> Peace out, Indies. Peace.